welcome to the Speaking Podcast. You can find all our episodes on speakingpodcast.com. My guest today is South Carolina in the USA. He's got 40 years plus professional investment manager advisor. He's retirement income independence coach. He's the author of two books. So please welcome Steve Selengut. Well, thanks for the introduction, Roy. Pleasure to be with you today. Yeah, no, no, I'm looking forward to this. And uh, yeah, as because uh, I, in fairness to you, you know, you've listened to some of the shows, and I don't kind of touch much on the the money side, but it's actually a very important thing, and it's probably good timing because I've in in Ireland when you hit so I'm fifty one. When you hit fifty, you can kind of you know you can get your pension, you can get twenty five percent tax. So you know, it's simple when you went to start the pension. The amount of hoops I had to jump through. They look for everything. And I don't know, is that the same in the States? But it's it's painful when you want to get your money out. Well, in uh, with Social Security, which is, I think, what we're talking about for the U.S. side, it's pretty routine. You go in, you check in, you get your IDs and all that stuff. And then um, <clears throat> they really lead you through it. And you, um, you go in about three months before your birthday, before you're eligible. And then uh, by the time that comes around, your first check usually shows up the month. In our case, we were self-employed, so instead of 65, we had to do 66 for some reason. But today, I think today it's over 67 for the people to start getting full Social Security. And, and you really have a choice whether to take it at your eligibility age or you can wait and... Uh, you know, take it even later if you want to. I don't know why people do that. I'm a money guy, so I want my hands on that money as soon as I can so I can invest it. A lot of people say, well, I don't need it, quote, now, so I'll leave it in there and let that monthly thing go. Um, my my whole premise, uh, as in my book, my whole premise is you can grow that income quarterly, you know, annually. You don't want it to sit there. You can grow it at a much higher rate then the change in the social security payment will be because you have you have more sources of income to help you do that you have two and they don't they usually don't have any because the trust fund left the building years ago you know the, the congress of our our congress manages to pay every dollar or spend every dollar that comes in it doesn't matter what it was designated for or who or who put it there they spend it you know so <laughs> so, like um, we mentioned, burnt regarding, I think we had uh, something similar with the cut in the grass. But I'd like to guess to know you a little bit to kind of see your career. And then I know your father was actually in construction as well. So I've heard that in some show that you were on. So you may just give us a little synopsis of it. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I, I got started. Uh, the first business I ever had or run was my own la mowing lawns. And I had a at that time, I had a side gig as well. I used to teach friends and, and others how to water ski, you know. So, you know, I had two things going, and my father was a, a real estate developer and uh, uh, vertical integration. You might have heard of vertical integration. means you pretty much control everything that goes into your doing of your business. So he and his attorney owned a lumber yard, for example, so they got their materials cheaper, blah, blah, blah. They owned the land. They built homes. They took back the mortgages. They provided the insurance coverage for the house and the cars and, and all the other stuff. And one of the things I learned from what he did was uh, the importance that he placed on the income um, generating activities in his program. He was making money through the lumberyard. He was making uh, monthly income from the rentals. He was making money from the insurance payments. He was uh, making money from the mortgage mortgage payments he was getting. So he told me, you know, pretty much income is king. I mean, you can you can have all the wealth and market value, so to speak, or, you know, uh, homes and land and things like that that are worth something. But all by themselves, they don't give you a penny to spend. And uh, as he as he used to put it, I need a lot of pennies to support your mother. And uh, so he emphasized for me that you know 
uh, what you whenever whatever you do, you want to have another. You want to have a source of income that's growing. You want to have a source of income that's growing. And in fact, he made me give him like twenty five percent of uh, the money I was making mowing lawns and the other stuff. And he he invested it for me. And uh, when I was twenty five uh, years old, I got a Manila envelope thrown on my my table in front of me. Happy birthday and Opened it up, and there were probably 40 different stock certificates in there. The days of stock certificates are long gone, but the idea is that I had already, I already had a portfolio of, uh, actually today they call them dividend stocks, but they were all the big name. I would say probably half of them were the Dow Jones average at the time. Companies you companies you'd recognize like IBM and GE and uh, I think General Motors was in there, a couple of oil companies, stuff like that. A couple that have gone under or, or disappeared, like Sears, you know, were in there at the time. So um, that's where I got my start. And I, as soon as I deposited that with the broker, I started to see the dividends come in. I started to study the stock market. And, and I never went into the real estate business with him because I got fascinated with what I was doing. And... Um, there are a lot of parallels between real estate investing and stock market investing that, that most people really uh, never stop to think about. And in fact, I didn't really put it down in writing, so to speak, or, or really get my handles on it until I did a podcast a month or two ago with a real estate guy. And we were talking about the income that he focuses on with his rentals. And it's the same with me. I focus on the income I receive from, from the closed-end funds I use to invest in the securities markets. Um, and he talked about flipping properties or, you know, buying things when you know you can sell them right away, even rental properties and things like that. And I do the same thing. I have a target profit level for everything I buy in the stock market. So... I'm flipping stocks and he's flipping real estate, you know, so there's a lot of parallels between the mindset that goes into it. Um, I, I, I prefer the market way of doing things because I don't have to, I don't have a, have to have a plunger and keys and all the other stuff in the back of my car in case a tenant calls up and has a problem. I don't have to, I don't have to put huge sums of money um, into a new property to buy it, right? I mean, I can buy a stock, you know, closed-in fund, 100 shares of stock for $4,000, you know, I really. So, you know, I, I, I don't have that same problem. I don't have to go to the bank for every transaction to borrow money and things like that. So I like that. I like One of the big things is, and I know it happened to me a lot, is which property you can be asset-rich and cash-poor because you can't just sell it unless you want to really give it away which nobody right. wants to do. And it's very hard to have cash flow. Right. It's a liquidity problem. And there, and with the stock market, you know, the stock market, they trade millions of shares a day. I mean, there there's no liquidity in most securities. And the ones, the equity side is very liquid for the most part. There are some very few uh, issues that don't have high liquidity, but that's that's rare. Um, but the other side of the financial picture, the equity is the ownership side of corporations. Uh, on the on the debt side, on the debt side where they borrow money, the bonds, the preferred stocks, the uh, you know short term loans and liens and things like that, and government bonds and things, um, those things aren't so liquid. Uh, if you want to own a corporate bond issue, for example, um, you know, you may not be able to, you know, you, you have to ask your broker what's available, you know, because people don't sell these things like they do. They usually hold them for the long haul because uh, most people understand how they react to interest rates. But there is a market for them, but it's thin. And your broker may not be able to get you the price that, you know, you have it in your portfolio and it says it's worth 102 a bond. You might have to sell it for 98 
you know, if it's uh, if it's selling at, uh, you may want if you want to try to buy something that's that's under par, you might wind up paying more than par because they're taking a markup both ways, you know. So it's a whole different market. So what I discovered about 20, 22 years ago were uh, income closed end funds, where they're they're professionally managed portfolios of of hundreds, sometimes a thousand or more, um, different corporate bonds or different municipal bonds or loan papers or mortgages, any of these illiquid things are traded like stocks on the exchange. And that's what I've been using for my clients. I, I managed money for about 40 years, like I think you said. And um, I managed... When I, when I sold my business last year, I had about $110 million under management. And probably 70% of that was invested in the beginning because of the age of my clients, many of whom were even older than I am, um, which is saying something, um, were mostly in income securities for, for the, the, the intrinsic safety and the income generation. You know, so those um, that's where I really took that whole area out of the fixed income market. I created, in a sense, liquidity. I can go out and sell my bonds tomorrow at the price, at a market price, just like I can a stock. And that's that's a big, big plus in that area, the financials, financial picture. I'm with an advisor because, like I mentioned about my pensionated bond as well, and I just get these statements saying, if it goes up 6%, it's going to be worth this. If it's going up 8%, it's going to be worth this. And the next year, they tell me the same thing, and it didn't really look like much was happening. You know, <laughs> they were making money from it. With some of the managers and systems going in place, some charge a percentage of it. But what I've also seen, and I'm aware of, there's some, when it's been traded, whether sold or bought, the person is getting the kickback. It's like with your dad with the, you know, all the different kind of things where you get money. I mean, I was doing that myself. I was doing currency exchange. I was doing insurance and mm -hmm. organizing, which is great because you get money on the thing. But for the investor, because there's, there's some out there and they're taking a percentage of their amount of money in there, but they're also kind of doing stuff like they're double dipping, whereas when they're buying and selling, they're taking a percentage. What's the I, kind of, is that regulated now or is that the norm? Well, it's changed. It's changed in the United States significantly. I don't know about Europe. I don't know if there is a, still such a thing as a commission in Europe. The There are literally, uh, unless you go to your online broker or whatever, and you actually call them up on the phone and say, help me with this, you can trade for free. Okay? Um, in the financial services industry advisors uh, pretty much no longer do that double dipping thing. They no longer have a separate advisor like I was, that I was getting a fee and the broker was getting commissions when I'd trade. So uh, between my fee and the commissions, the client was getting hosed basically. But that, that changed. Um, after even before the uh, online brokerage firms kind came on, most brokers who did um, investment advice became fee only, where they would charge a, a point and a half, a, between 1.5 and maybe 2%. We never ever charged as much as 2%, um, but they would get an annual fee. So theoretically in the, in the advertising world of investment advisors, they say, we only make money if you make money. But that they really should be saying is, we make more money when your market value goes up. We make less money when it goes down. But that what they don't tell you is that their emphasis is investing in things, hoping that the market value will go up even if your needs as an old guy or as an, a person who's approaching retirement age, even if your need is really for an increased level of income to replace your salary, you know, that's what you want to see grow. Market value, on the cover of my book, I have a statement 
Uh, market value fuels the ego. Income fuels the yacht. You know, all you do when you raise somebody's market value is you increase your fees and you make them feel wealthy. But they can't take their they can't take their brokerage statement to the cruise company and say, here, I got a lot of money. I want to go on this cruise. The cruise company is going to say, well, you're going to have to sell some of that, buddy, and give me cash in order to get on the boat. So the emphasis on Wall Street, the emphasis in the financial markets, in my mind, is kind of particularly for older people, people 50 and up, people who have to start, at least in the back of their mind somewhere, they're thinking at time, you know, I want to have more money from my investment portfolio than my salary so I can say goodbye, guys. I don't want to work here anymore. I'm going to go do my own thing. And um, the emphasis, uh, the way Wall Street emphasizes growth and market value, that's not going to happen because you're never going to have enough income. If you were to, if you were to open up a thousand advisor portfolios for their clients, you would find that the average income being generated is less than three percent. And and I know that because I've opened up thousands of portfolios uh, from that had been managed by brokers and advisors where that that was the case. And uh, I'm doing that as a uh, I least you call my retirement profession now is to be an income coach to people and help them get more money from their uh, portfolios than they're current get, currently getting. So I, I see a lot of these situations where there's a very, very low level of income coming in on a very large portfolio. I also see a lot of other, other problems. Some of them are self-inflicted. Uh, I, I have great respect for, uh, you know, investment advisors and their skills and abilities to uh, protect clients from risk. Most clients, <clears throat> where they they leave the fold, they say, well, I want to, but I just heard about this and I want to buy it. The guy, a broker really can't say no to that. He can advise against it, but he can't say no. Um, and um, most advisors won't say no because they don't want to lose the client, you know. In my case, you know, I did it my way, <laughs> And if the client didn't like it that way, I'd try to refer him to somebody who would go out there and buy that IPO for him or invest in Bitcoin if they want to, but I'm not going to do it for him, you know, that type of thing. So fortunately, I had the luxury of being very particular that way. Is, is there investment uh, that basically, instead of charging like the one and a half, two points that they work on a percentage of the increase? Because for me, that's what I'd prefer. That if you you said, yeah, right, you know, I get it. I take twenty percent of anything above because even if it's it's level and you're taking say two percent, not you or some of them, you're actually right. using as well as taking inflation into account. You know, you're really getting right. I I understand that hedge funds can do that. Private hedge funds can do it based on how much they make you. You know, and and that's that's probably not a bad deal. Um, what I what I used to do is I would tell my clients um, that my with my methodology, because I'm a profit taker, I had targets for everything. I, I operated my portfolios like they were department stores. You know, everything was for sale at, at a specific markup. And I told them that I was pretty certain that in, in a normal year, I'd be able to make more than they paid in fees and capital gains. So on top of the base income, the dividends, the interest, the distributions they were getting on the securities, I would also make them at least the one and a half percent that they were paying in fees to actually, you know, in, in capital gains. But the fees they pay, the fees they pay don't just go to the advisor. If you have an, a financial advisor and he's charging 1.85 percent, I mean, he's probably getting maybe five-tenths of a percent. There's the broker. If there's a separate broker and a separate broker-dealer, they're both getting their, they're both splitting the rest. If it's directly with a broker-dealer and it's an employee of that broker-dealer, the guy's probably getting about 3%. Is an employee? Maybe 3% of the 1.8 you're paying, and the house is getting the rest. 
So that's that's how it actually works. So, <clears throat> so a portfolio of mine where you you know in your head you might have been just saying if you were managing a hundred million dollars you were making a million and a half. That's not the case. You know, not even close. You know, so that's so that's the one thing. Your your the, your fees are not just going to the guy you have, and the guy you have. Um, as much as he wants to help you, and I think most of them certainly do, he's required by that, his boss, the owner, um, to do certain things. Like there could be a requirement that a third of the money under management has to be in model portfolios, and we specify the model portfolios that you have to be in. Well, what's a model portfolio? A model portfolio is managed not by your guy. It's managed by somebody else in headquarters or somewhere. And they pick a portfolio of, let's say, 75 stocks that they say are designed for a person within six years of retirement. And then they'll have another model designed for a person who is early in his investment career and has plenty of time for retirement. You know, they'll have a, a whole menu of different types of models. Most of them will contain the same securities. Some of them will be a little bit more speculative than others. The older you get, the more recognizable, successful, dividend-paying companies will be in there. So it's not a bad thing. The bad thing is about it, it's still designed so that those guys are going to get their 1.5%, and that's based on the market value growth, not the income production. So you're not going to... You're not going to find any models that are going to pay you 6% or 8% or 9%. My portfolios right now are because interest rates just went up and prices went down. My portfolios today are earning around 10% because of that. I mean, you're just not going to find that in a, in a normal managed environment. Um, because you mentioned about the capital gains, and I know with the property, there's ways of actually, you know, deferring that and also putting it into a trust. Is it possible to use a trust for the capital gains in investment? Um, well, you know, one, you do have a couple options in that sense. You can put it into what we call tax-deferred programs like IRAs and Roths. And it could be if you have a, if your business has a individual 401k for you, I managed a couple of those. Um, you can you can, in a sense, be putting the capital gains away, you know, that type of thing. But um, for the most part, no. Um, you're paying the taxes. Uh, what, are the, what are the tax rates in Europe, usually? Not that very so much. Like in Poland, kind of 18 to 30. But in Ireland, I mean, when I got a bond and everything, I got the 25% tax rate, but I took the rest at 50%. So fifty percent, yeah, yeah, and even I know some of the Scandinavians are even higher. So yeah, yeah, I know. Well, it all depends on what you're getting for your money, and you know you're getting free free healthcare for one thing. Well, in Ireland, so, yeah, you don't get much because uh, yeah, people are on trolleys and everything. So yeah, they're, they're and they've just uh, from Ukraine they were they put eight hundred thousand for all the animals. They're bringing the animals as well, like but yet there's oh, people yeah. living in cars, Irish people living in cars, and people on hospitals and. Yeah. So I okay, but anyway, in, uh, in the United States, I don't think the tax rate is ever up to fifty. Thirty-five um, percent is is one of the higher brackets, I'd guess. <clears throat> so my emphasis has, or my my my, you know, let, let me just back up a minute. When you're in real estate <clears throat> and you own properties, the income is kind of fixed by the the rentals and so forth. And the mortgage mortgage income rentals and things. So you, and it doesn't really matter if the price fluctuates, right? You're getting the same income. And in and, and the stock market and the bond market, it's it's the same, it's the same, it's the same way. Um and again, I get with that most people emphasize market value in, instead of the income. So if you it's the capital that produces the income. The, um, the amount you've put in there, you bought that place for 10 grand or that stock or that that uh, condo for 250 and it's the amount that you're getting in rent that's the important thing. It doesn't matter if the price falls, 
where the price goes up, you're, if you're not thinking of selling it, you're still getting the same rent. And, and it's the same in the market. So if you, so it's that capital that you've invested, that's the important thing. That's what's producing the income, not the market value. So if you take a loss or are afraid of taking a profit because of the taxes, and in our place, it's a 30, like a 35% maximum, a 25% if it's long-term, there's a distinction. You're, you could say, I'm going to take a $1,000 loss to keep myself from paying $350 in taxes. So I'm losing $1,000 in capital instead of spending $350 in capital. It doesn't make any sense to tax manage portfolio. I used to tell my clients, I said, look, I'm going to, if you're an individual investor and it's not an IRA or something, you're going to pay a lot of taxes with me because I'm going to make you a lot of money. So I said, and I jokingly would say, if you don't want to pay the taxes, take that money, pay it to me as a fee, and I'll want it. You'll deduct it and I'll, I'll pay you taxes, you know, that type of thing. Because that's really, it made no sense, you know, at that time. At that time, they could they could deduct investment management fees. Not anymore. They can't. <clears throat> so, anyway, I was always joking when I said that it wasn't real. <laughs> so you mentioned about uh, Bitcoin before. So, have you done any of the investments in blockchain? No. No. I, I and I I I use the I define the word investment differently than a lot of people do. Um, every, every investment involves risk, and in my mind, every investment should also involve income. And if it doesn't pay income, I'm not going to take the risk of owning it. And Bitcoin is one of those, in my mind, speculations that people get caught up in, like 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 gold futures and gold bullion and stuff. Did you ever try to go to the pharmacy and buy a prescription with a block of gold? You know, I I I don't understand how people get caught up in these things. I it's really so easy to develop a well-diversified, safe portfolio of securities that generate a large amount of income um, without taking that kind of risk. Uh, people say that the kind of things I invest in have risk too, but they do. But when they develop mutual funds in the first place, they they did the, develop them so that the average guy who is now this is back in the let's say the 30s 1930s after the Great Depression, and they're trying to get the individual investor back into the market, and they were afraid because they didn't want to be one of those guys that was jumping out of windows, you know, when the, when the when the economy falls apart, you know. So they came up with this thing, the mutual fund. It had been around way before, but it really got popular at that time because. The, the little guy could get in there and he could own IBM. He could own all the X, all the, uh, you know, the oil stocks and all those types of things just by owning a unit in this managed fund that a professional was taking care of for him. And that was a great thing because it, it did. It really, it really is one of the things that boosted the stock market from the Dow from like a thousand to 38,000 where it is today was the, was the impact of first the mutual funds and then the 401k type investing um, that the corporations were allowed to do for their employees. That's what brought the people back in. Well, way before that, way, way before that, this thing called closed-end funds were invented in Europe somewhere. My friends in Amsterdam tell me that they are responsible for the creation of this thing. And it's, remember you were talking about a trust before? These are pass-through trusts where the management of the fund, <clears throat> of the trust, has to pay out 95% of its profits to its shareholders. So there you have an entity that's traded on the stock market like a common stock, which actually is paying you 95% of what it makes. None of the other vehicles do that. Mutual funds don't do that. ETFs don't do that. Uh, only closed-end funds do it. And could you imagine if the, if the big companies like the, uh, what's the one that's making all the noise today that just turned in a good, a good report and the market is up 2% because they 
were more pos more profitable than they were supposed to be. It does. I'm, I'm certain that company doesn't pay a penny in dividends. But anyway, what if what if Amazon had to pay ninety five percent of its income to its shareholders? Wouldn't that be amazing? And it would be good for the economy too, actually, because those people would spend it. They're not going to spend it. They're going to buy more stores, or they're going to buy more buildings, or more books to put up. But anyway, you know, the whole idea of this trust is unique because now I have these 200 different closed-in funds made up of some are half of them are made up of equity, mostly stocks, stock market in instruments, and the other ones are mostly bonds and mortgages and real estate. They're all paying you know, an average around 9%, and I can trade them every day just like stocks. And when these guys, like today, those managers are probably taking profits in all these companies that are going up, they're going to share 95% of the profits with the, sh with the shareholders of the closed-end funds that I own. So that's, you know, that's, that's where I am in that area. And and as far as speculations, there are closed-end funds that do almost everything. There are now ETFs that do uh, Bitcoin. I wouldn't go near them with a 10-foot pole because I'm old. And I can't, I don't want to put my money in something that's speculative and it doesn't pay any income. And I, I, I focus on, I'm an income-focused investor. Are you finding... You know, if somebody's cashing in that, because I know that with the 50 states, that they all have their own tax laws and everything, which is kind of strange, you know, but, but do people then move to where it's better for them, the lowest tax state, just when they're yeah, cashing? You know, interestingly enough, my friends and I were having the very same conversation. And there are two states that we are considering because South Carolina has an 8% income tax which really annoyed me when I sold my business because not only did I have to pay the feds, but I had, you know what I mean? But um, Florida was, is one with a zero tax rate. And uh, I think the other one was Kentucky or Arkansas or Tennessee, each of which have, you know, attractive qualities. And so we, we actually went down to Florida and we were checking out some uh, real estate down there. And... Um, Property taxes are very, very high. I mean, the state, one way or the other, the state's going to get you. They got to get the money to provide the services, you know? So the, uh, I understand uh, sales taxes, uh, real estate taxes are high. There are some, some personal property state uh, taxes. So if you're going down there with your yacht, your yacht is going to get taxed at a high rate, you know? Uh, so, you know, you're going to pay taxes one way or the other. So we pretty much um, we haven't we haven't made up our minds yet. But you know, who knows? Five years from now, maybe I'll be in Florida. I don't know. But so, with in the, what mistakes do you see people making all the time that they shouldn't be making? Because obviously, with your experience, you can see it. But like, is there things that you see people are doing, and you should say, "Oh no, don't do that." Well, I th I. I would say from what I've seen, and I've, I've probably uh, done portfolio reviews and coaching for 75 people or so since I started. Um, the most, the things I see the most, uh, bad diversification. <clears throat> I've seen people with a um, million dollar portfolio spread over three securities. Maybe three mutual funds, maybe one of them an individual stock. I, I spoke to a guy the other day that had him over a million dollars in his old company stock. You know, uh, a third of his portfolio in one, one company, and and it's a company that doesn't pay any dividends, really. So you know, you, you it's you see the baldness I'm getting here. That's from pulling my hair out when I see these types of things. Um, that's so diversification. I mean, I'm I I'm an I'm a fanatic diversifier. I, I like I said, I own over two hundred different positions, and every one of those positions has an average of 
200 or 300 securities inside it. So diversification, totally out of control with me. I am, I am overly diversified, and I admit it, and I'm okay with that, because if any one of my securities goes to zero, can we name any securities that have gone to zero? Enron, Merrill Lynch, you know? I won't even feel a pinch, because there's nothing that I own that I own even 2% of my over, overall portfolio. So, and that's how I used to manage the accounts that I managed. It was the same way. Overall diversification. Uh, that's, that's probably the single most frequent error. Um, the second will be income generation. It's just a function of the environment that they've grown up in. It's a market value focused environment. And all everybody cares about is they don't even look at the income. You can't get a quote at my Fidelity program. When I plug in a stock to get a quote on it, the first screen that comes up doesn't even tell me the yield on that security. That's the most important thing to me, the yield. It doesn't even show it. It shows me how much the stock is up and down today. So it's one day, you know, who cares? But that you look for a mutual fund, Google a mutual fund and look it up. Try to find the yield on that mutual fund. It's, it's hard. You, some of them don't even show it. Same with ETFs. So it's just that focus. They, nobody's telling them that income is king. Nobody's telling them. They're all saying, oh, you we made you this, you know, you, your total return was 20%. Last year, your total return was 28%. But they didn't tell you that at the end of 23, all three market, all three market indicators were still below where they were two years ago. So what if you went up 28%? In the meantime, I've taken $100,000 in profits and I've, you know, been reinvesting my 9% earnings for those two years. Okay, so I've been growing my income. My market value is down. I don't care. It's still growing that income, growing that capital. I have more, I have more houses and hotels on my Monopoly board now than I did three months ago. Really? See what I mean? That's, With the, difference. that's the difference in focus. So the focus is not on income. So that's the second mistake. And both of these things also, while we're talking about them, there are, there are four ways to minimize your financial risk when you're an investor. There's quality, there's income, diversification, and profit-taking. If you have targets for profit-taking and do all the other things, your financial risk, your risk of going having a, a security go under has been minimized to the most you can, you can possibly do. So... Quality, I do not find, is a problem. Most of the securities that I've looked at in these hundreds of portfolios are good companies. I mean, like these model portfolios, which I always joke about. It makes me laugh just to think about them. Um, they're all good companies. You know, they're, they're well-researched or so on. Uh, some of them pay minuscule dividends, but they're not income-focused. You can't say, oh, you're in big danger. It's diver the diversification was big danger, right? When they had more than 5% uh, in one position. But typically in a model or in most of the portfolios I looked at, that's, that's not a problem. The quality. They're all good quality. Uh, just as some quality companies do pay um, income and some don't. You know, you could have... You could have a portfolio of municipal bonds where you have all those problems of liquidity and so forth, and you're getting, um, you know, three percent, three and a half percent tax-free. Uh, but you had, but you do have that liquidity. You're getting your payments are semi-annual, and instead of monthly, um, where you can buy closed end of funds with hundreds, literally hundreds, even in your own home state. You can buy them with um, hundreds of securities 
with an average yield well over 4%, well, right now the yield's over 5%, and have instant liquidity in the stock market because they're traded like stocks. You know, so, so there's, you know, there's different ways to get the job done. Profit-taking, then, is the other one. You'll find people who get to retirement and they still have this stock or stocks they inherited from their parents and their portfolio. I remember once uh, very early in my career where I was, I, I literally drove up from South Jersey um, with a, a wad of um, Exxon, or SO, I'm not even sure if it's Exxon yet, Exxon certificates in my briefcase, over a million dollars worth that this guy had gotten through a pass-through trust. Um, that was his entire inheritance. Like I, it had to be, I don't know, maybe 1.4, 1.6 million. And we put it in, we put it in the brokerage account. And the the average cost on these things was like a dollar ninety-five. And the stock price was, you know, like in the fifties, I think, something like that. So this was his only money. He wanted to buy, hey, I'm rich. I want to buy a new house. Well, in order to buy a new house, he had to sell in those days, uh, $250,000 worth of the stock. Well, the $250,000 worth of the stock of that, 225000 of it was taxable. <laughs> so, very, so then he had to sell more stock to pay the taxes. And then, of course, he had to sell more stock. You know what I mean? So he was just in this vicious circle of even though Exxon paid a reasonable dividend, it wasn't enough for him to change his lifestyle as a new millionaire would want to do without having this huge tax burden. So anyway, he started looking around and uh, he, he found someone who sold him, uh, unbeknownst to me, he sold him some private uh, master limited partnerships of some kind. I'm, I'm, I forget what they called him in those days, but I think... I don't think they're legal anyway. So he did this because it was a, he could do this somehow and have a tax write-off from it. Well, he did. He got a tax write-off by losing all his money. In it. But in any event, so uh, that's that's the kind of things you bump up again when you when you're looking at these portfolios, um, these heirloom stocks, these things that people have held forever. I had a conversation with a guy the other day, and he said, "Yeah, I recognize that." And I'm going to slowly get rid of me at about 10 years to retirement. I think I'm going to save a share or two of each one just because I said, you know, go out and buy five of these closed end equity funds. And I can assure you that they own some of that stock. You don't have to own one share. You can own thousands of shares as an owner of this portfolio of securities. So, you know, it's just, it's, it's different. So, you know, those, so those mistakes, not taking your profits is a biggie, uh, not only because it, it puts you in a position that you're going to have to pay a lot of taxes later, but let's think of how you generate income. There are, there are, there are two streams of income. And the one is the dividends and the interest you get. A, it's some of the closed end funds, you're even getting income from from uh, covered call options because they're the only safe form of option trading, right? So you can get income from several sources, but you're getting this every month. You're getting this safe income. And then there's the capital gains, that stream of income. So every time you take a profit, you're adding that profit becomes new capital. You're creating capital that you can reinvest right now at, you know, eight, nine, ten percent. So you you make an effort in a uh, in a market that's been in a a market that's been beaten down by higher interest rates and you can get these great prices, you don't find too many profits. So when you get them, you take advantage of it and increase. And you also have the equity side of your portfolio, which is now producing profits because that side of the portfolio is going up. So you can then take those profits and keep your asset allocation uh, properly. And so you're adding this extra money. And I, and I, and 
say, for example, your portfolio generates uh, 25000 a month from all these. I'm talking about a large portfolio, obviously. 25000 a month in dividends. And by just taking small profits throughout the first six weeks of the year, you've been able to generate nearly 30000 in profits. That's totally separate from that 25000 So in effect, the year is now 13 months of income. Right? You generated another year's worth of income in six weeks. And I've done it, so I know it's doable. Uh, I have Facebook groups where people are, you know, they go on there and they brag about the fact that they've made another month's income through, through profit taking. So that's the second source of income. I I call it my rich uncle, basically, you know. I, I look at the market. The market's up. It's going to be up. According to the futures, it's going to be up significantly today. I'm going to take profits. That's my rich uncle. He's saying, here, take this money. It's yours. And that's what you got to do. If you have that profit taking discipline, you can you can add to your income and grow your income so that by the time, uh, as I was when I was 30, when I got that pile of securities, you know, seven, eight years later, I said goodbye to my employer because I was making much more money on my investment portfolio than I was making in salary. And with the, the, the dividends then, like, what are the top paying ones at the moment? Like, say, the top five. What, what's the percentage as an investment oh. side of things? Oh, I mean, you can you can find these closed-end funds that are paying in, in the teens, you know, 15, 14. And and you have to look at them with, you know, you have to go inside and see how are they doing this. But when you look at it, recognize that the, how many times in our lifetimes have interest rates gone from zero to 5% or changed by 5% to the upside in the space of 18 months? Almost never. The cycle is usually much longer. So a lot of these interest rate sensitive securities contain containing bonds and notes and things like that, the prices of those securities inside have to go down with the right rising interest rates, okay? And a lot of people sell them because they think this net asset value reduction is dangerous for some time. They don't realize, wait a minute, these are bonds, good company bonds. The company has to pay them back at full face value, even if so that what they're worth today is not nearly important. They're still paying the same income. So these things become, the prices go down and the yields go up on these perfectly decent bonds. And that's why the prices are so high. But you look inside and you see if there's anything else going on. Um, look at their price chart. See if it's really tumbled more than the normal, you know, or if they're, if they're, um, the dividend they are paying has changed in any way. If you look at most of these, they paid the same level pretty much of dividends for 20 years, you know. So I do I do that type of analysis every month. I look at all the securities I own, what their dividends, what their dividends, current month dividends are, how it relates to the past dividends and so on, just to check that out. So you can determine if yields are high just because of interest rates going crazy or if there's something else going on. So you have to do, you have to do your due diligence in any kind of investing, particularly in my position where I'm talking to other people about it. But, you know, I, I find that that universe of securities at 200 some are plus pretty much stays about that number right now. Um, as you know, as it as it always is. But yeah, you 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 can't just go out and say and put them all in order and say I'm going to get all those top ones. That's not a good. That's not good diversification either. You know, you want to diversify. There are there are maybe 50 companies like BlackRock, Nuveen, Eaton Vance, um, Gabelli, all these very, very huge huge financial companies that offer these closed-end funds, and they don't advertise them, but they're there. And uh, you spread your 
I spread the investments among all of them. And all of them, um, you know, all of them behave pretty nicely. Only very rarely have I, there's only one that's on my list of, I will not buy any more of this one. You know, and I, you know, but anybody who works with me will, will see that it's not on my list. So, you know, so it, it doesn't happen often. It doesn't, I mean, BlackRock's probably one of the biggest companies in, in the world as far as financial services is concerned and managing and managing other people's money. And they're one of the biggest providers of all kinds, all three kinds of closed end funds, the tax exempt, the taxable and the equity. And, uh, I do own a lot of BlackRock and new I, all the ones I mentioned and others and several others, probably about 40, 45, 50, I don't know. Something like that. Okay. And, uh, just finally, you've got the two books, you've got, uh, the brainwashing of the American investor and, uh, the other one is the retirement M money secrets. You may just kind of briefly say what's in it so that people will know what to have. Well, the, the brainwashing book was primarily focused on, ec on individual equities, what people today would call dividend stocks, because I'd never buy a stock that, you know, didn't pay a dividend. I never bought mutual funds and new issues and things like that. So that's what it focused on. It, and it gave all the other stuff sustained, the quality, diversification, income, profit taking, the market cycle, and the focus on income. Everything else is the same. It's just I was using stocks for equities at that time. And I did that pretty much up until the financial crisis. I had I'd already switched over to closed end funds for my income investing side. And I had started to pick away I, I always had some equity closed end funds, like uh, some that had been around for hundreds of years. Um, but I stopped doing the stocks because they no longer, you know, we had like a 12 year rally. And by 2010, I couldn't find anything to buy because of my rules. I had rules that I wouldn't buy anything unless it was down 20% from its 52 week high. And they just weren't getting down there. And then when you when you did find one that was down there, you had to scratch your head and say, if this one's down there and everything else is up, something's got to be wrong. So you wouldn't buy it anyway. So I changed. And I said, my the guy I worked with and I, we tried to come up with a new way of figuring out getting the same fundamentals. We're, we were fundamentalists. We weren't technical people. You know, we don't try to prick, we don't try to predict the future with the history of the past. We go on the fundamentals of the companies. Do, are they profitable? Do they pay dividends? Blah, blah, blah. So I couldn't find anything anymore. So I started going more and more and more into closed-end funds. And in a book, that, to that, in the back chapter, I, I have a illustration of a guy who I was managing money for who was primarily in the stock market for his equities. And it shows the history of how I gradually moved him into closed-end funds. And you'll see how the income just goes crazy and the working capital that he has invested just really went you know nuts over that period of time just by changing to the higher income vehicles. So that's what the brainwashing was there. Uh, retirement money secrets is like the why I transitioned and what I transitioned to and why I still have exactly the same dividend stocks in my portfolios that I have it in a much safer package because the package is same as the mutual fund package in the sense of what it contains. The difference is, like I said, it's a pass-through trust, right? All the income comes to me, to me and it trades like a stock. So they don't have to wait for overnight pricing or anything like that. So that's, that's the difference between the two books. The brainwashing book don't go out and buy it. It's free, as you know. At, at my website, when you get there, uh, there's a, a thing called freebies. The brainwashing book is one of those freebies. So all you got to do is ask and you can have it. The other one you got to pay a very small amount of money for, which probably will be worth it to you. Yeah, excellent. Listen, thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. Steve, you might let people know where they can find you. Um, they can find me at theincomecoach.net. Um, that's where it explains how I, what I do now. And there's also a link to the book. Uh, I'd prefer it 
if you have read the book before you come and talk to me about investing, because otherwise we'll probably have to have several conversations to get you to that to that point. And it'll save you money um, if you read the book first. Excellent. I'll make sure I put the link up on the audio and the video. Thank you very much, Dave. Okay. Appreciate it. Great talking to you. So that's all for the Speaking Podcast. You can, well, I didn't help when my camera just cut off, but that's all for the Speaking Podcast. You find all our episodes on speakingpodcast.com. Until next week, take care. So I hope you enjoyed this week's episode. As mentioned at the start, you'll find my six podcasts on buyer.link forward slash podcaster. And also, if you'd like to start a podcast or do a podcasting tour, you'll find the information on that or on the QR code that's there. Be sure to give us a thumbs up, five star rating, and share with your friends because it really helps. Until next week, take care.